Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Abraham Morgenthaler, and uh, I'm delighted to be with you today uh, to give a, give a series of lectures on testosterone uh, therapy. Um, this is educational content for docflix.live, and I'm going to be speaking about uh, testosterone therapy. Uh, I am a associate professor of urology um, at Harvard Medical School. I'm the past president of the Androgen Society, and I'm the senior editor of the journal Androgens Clinical Research and Therapeutics. Um, we have a number of causes of testosterone deficiency. Primary, again, is also a, a whole long list of conditions, as you see on the left in this slide, um, that basically make the testicles not work well. Uh, testicular trauma, radiation, uh, orchitis, um, cryptorchidism. Uh, secondary tends to be pituitary tumors, radiation to the pituitary or areas of the brain. But one of the most common, the most common, in fact, uh, cause of testosterone deficiency is aging. And in aging, we have usually a normal LH uh, with a low level of testosterone. What are the symptoms and signs of testosterone deficiency? Uh, the sexual symptoms tend to be diminished libido, erectile dysfunction, um, uh, difficulty achieving orgasm, uh, those are the main sexual symptoms. Non-sexual symptoms include of the study. This is a meta-analysis of the effects of testosterone therapy in men who are hypogonadal, men who are eugonadal, meaning normal levels of testosterone, or mixed populations. And you see that really the only group that responds well is uh, the men who are have low testosterone. Uh, to be What happened after that, though, is that uh, in late 2013, was a uh, paper was published that raised a lot of concerns about testosterone and cardiovascular issues. Um, and uh, I'm going to comment on it a little bit later when we go over risks. And the bottom line is, it turns out to not be true. It, as a matter of fact, it appears to me that the weight of evidence indicates that testosterone therapy or having a normal testosterone is beneficial in terms of cardiovascular risk. But in any case, it became a media sensation and uh, the FDA ended up having a meeting around testosterone and safety and cardio. And when I say coverage, I don't know exactly what the situation is uh, in your country, but um, coverage here means that uh, the, the company will pay for the treatment. Um, completely or to a large extent. And if they don't do that, uh... now I want to go back to the total versus the free testosterone story. And I showed you this in the pre in a previous lecture. This is, again is data from the European Male Aging Study. And, um, <clears throat> and uh, you see the age goes up from left to right. And we've got four graphs here looking at four different hormones. Testosterone levels, uh, in the upper left, free testosterone in the upper right. And what you see is that total testosterone doesn't really change much um, over 30 plus years of monitoring these men on average. There's a decline, but it's not a very impressive one. Whereas free testosterone drops by about a third. Uh, and that's really what's important. And what explains the discrepancy, not total testosterone? So um, I think uh, I'm just going to skip that one slide, but I think if you're looking for candidates for testosterone therapy, you need a little bit of the art of medicine. I think your clinical observations are important, and it's important to realize that there's a wide variability in presenting symptoms. Some men may have sexual symptoms that predominate. Others may have lack of energy or fatigue. Um, many of the symptomatic men may have normal total T values, but may have low calcul calculated or other free T values. Physical exam usually isn't that helpful in most men, but when you have abnormalities like small testicles, loss of body hair, um, uh, that's very helpful in, in making the diagnosis. And it turns out that in uh, some men may have low levels of hematocrit or hemoglobin, we have a lot of testosterone um, options uh, now. I don't know how many are available um, in Brazil, um, but this is what we have. Uh, the most common in the United States are have been around for a long time, 
and it's the injectable forms of testosterone, testosterone, cypionator, and anthate. They're what we call short-acting uh, injectables. Um, they're relatively inexpensive. Um, they're not that convenient. People don't really like getting injections that frequently. And what we worry about is that people, they, we call it a roller coaster <laughs> effect. If you know what a roller coaster is at the amusement parks, you go up and you go down. Um, so some of the people feel very good within a day or two of their injections, uh, but then near the end of their cycle, uh, they don't feel as good. Um, and usually if we're using these, um, you know, I don't think that it works well if you're trying to do it at a frequency of a longer frequency than every two weeks. We teach most of our men how to inject themselves. And if we do, we usually have them inject weekly. Um, it's supposed to be intramuscular, but subcutaneous works also and looks like it's just as good. There's some people who don't want to give themselves shots. And so we have them come to the office usually every two weeks. And the dose is, uh, starting dose is about 100 milligrams per week. So if they're going to get it every two weeks, the usual starting dose is 200. If they're going to be giving it to themselves or coming into the office every week, uh, we start with 100 milligrams. But you can move up. Rarely do we go lower, but some people will, and that's 100 milligrams is 0.5 cc's. Each cc is 200 milligrams uh, per cc or per milliliter. So we start at 0 0.5, and if that's not good enough, we go to 0 0.6 and 0 0.7, and occasionally, but not very often, we go above. Uh, that. One of the most uh, uh, successful products around the world uh, is long-acting uh, testosterone injections in the form of testosterone undecanoate. Uh, the trade name is Nibido. And uh, in the United States, we have a, <laughs> um, a lower dose agent. The FDA was worried about excessively high levels, but it's the only country where they have 750 milligrams um, in most countries, or if, you, if you're familiar with the name Nibido, it's a thousand milligrams. And it's given on average every 12 weeks. So it's about three months. Um, it says here on this slide, 10 week interval, that's for uh, the lower dose uh, in the United States and outside of the US, it's uh, at 12 weeks. But there's a certain amount of variability uh, also based on individual metabolism. I use a lot of pellets. Um, it's funny, pellets were one of the very first forms of testosterone when it was uh, synthesized and became commercially available in the 1930s. So they're subcutaneous and it's basically compressed um, powder of testosterone. And um, there's just about one or 2% of uh, binder, like a non-active uh, agent that just keeps everything together. And it looks like a piece of rice, a grain of rice. And um, in the United States, there is a FDA approved uh, uh, pellet, but there are a number of pharmacies that make their own uh, pellets. Uh, it just takes a few minutes to put it in under the skin. We usually do it in the buttock area um, or in the lower back. And um, what's nice about it is that it's also a long acting form of testosterone it can last three or four months, usually with very good levels in between, but it does have a risk of uh, a little uh, local wound infection. The pellets can work their way out, which is called extrusion, happens in about one or two percent of the cases. Um, but it's another form of long-acting uh, testosterone, and especially for people who travel, a very convenient form. Topicals or creams or uh, gels, um, were, came into use around the year 2001 and for many years were the most popular form of testosterone. Uh, it was convenient, the men rubbed it in, depending on the product, they rubbed it in their arms or on their chest or in their legs or in their sides. Uh, it's non-invasive, the patients felt like they had good control over where they were doing it. Uh, but there are a couple of issues, one is a lot of guys just didn't just stop doing it. They just didn't like having an extra thing that they had to do every day. 
Um, they didn't like the feel of it. In some cases, they didn't like the smell. But it's still a very commonly uh, used form of testosterone. Be aware if you're prescribing this that about 15 to 20 percent of your men may not absorb it well through the skin. And so um, if you're going to prescribe a gel or a cream, you must do a follow-up blood test after, and tell the patient they have to apply it before you get the blood test. You have to get a blood test and I wouldn't wait too long, certainly no more than a month, just to make sure that their levels really are going up while they're on treatment. <clears throat> there is a concern which um, we call transference, the idea that a man may, from his skin to skin contact, may um, get it onto his wife, or if he's holding a, a baby um, with you know, his naked chest against a naked baby skin that they can get virilized. Those cases are um, really quite uncommon, uh, but they have occurred, uh, and so it's just something to be aware of. We have um, now, uh, at least in the United States, an oral uh, testosterone uh, that is, uh, um, doesn't cause the, uh, the liver trouble that the older agents did. Uh, it's been approved in the United States and it has good testosterone levels. Uh, it's absorbed through the lymphatics, which is what, of the intestine, which is what helps it avoid the liver toxicity that the old oral testosterones had, where they were absorbed in the normal part of the gut through the blood system, uh, through the blood vessels, and there was high dose with the portal uh, system first pass uh, through the liver, uh, where the liver saw very high levels of testosterone, <clears throat> and there was known toxicity with that. We don't like the alkylated and, uh, androgens, uh, like methyl testosterone, and they're not recommended uh, for use. Um, but the oral, new oral ones, uh, testosterone on decanoate, uh, seem to be quite good, and there are a couple of others uh, that are now being evaluated by the FDA. I don't know how many countries that's available in. And this is just a graph showing that uh, the, the gold area, the yellow uh, area in between is sort of the normal concentration of testosterone, and injections tend to peak around day three, and two to three and gets above the normal range. So it gives us a brief excursion into the supra-physiologic range and then it drops. And that's why we think about the roller coaster effect. And the slide is supposed to show that patches or gels get you in the normal range and stay there. Uh, that's assuming that there's good absorption. The man <laughs> is okay putting it on every day. And, uh, but remember that not everybody absorbs it. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about prostate cancer. Um, this is really the biggest issue, I think, out there amongst physicians. It's been traditional teaching <laughs> for 75 years that testosterone is almost like the devil uh, when it comes to, pro to prostate cancer. This slide and others, prostate cancer is PCA. Um, and so this is what I learned. High testosterone causes prostate cancer. Low testosterone is supposed to be protective. Men with low testosterone were supposed to never get prostate cancer. And that if a doctor were foolish enough to give testosterone to a man with uh, prostate cancer, it would be like feeding a hungry tumor or pouring gasoline on a fire. Uh, and so, of course, it made sense that testosterone therapy would be contraindicated in men with prostate cancer. But some of this uh, has not, uh, is contradicted by the literature. So, Testosterone therapy is not associated with an increased risk of prostate cancer. These are data from a meta-analysis of 22 randomized control trials, RCTs. 11 of them were less than a year, 11 of them were more than a year in duration, over 2,000 men, and there was no difference in prostate cancer rates for men who got testosterone or men who got placebo. Well. I think that providing care for men with testosterone deficiency or with sexual issues in general, um, but let's focus on testosterone, I think it falls squarely into the WHO definition of health that I just read to you. Uh, the work is satisfying and gratifying, and it makes a huge difference in the lives of our patients and their partners. So. 
testosterone deficiency is really, in my opinion, a diminished state of health. 